organizers for giving me this opportunity here. It's uh, great to be able to drive an hour and meet all the world's experts in uh, collective dynamics. Um, so today I'm going to talk about collective dynamics in uh, swimming E. coli bacteria. And as you have heard from this morning's talks, collective dynamics plays important roles in many aspects of life. And it's either in a, just a colloidal suspension, which is a non-living uh, system, and all the living system. And uh, so the mere fact that we are here, a group of people who have share same interests gather in one room is a result of the collective dynamics. So I'm going to um, further enhance that by giving two examples of collective dynamics one example at a molecule level and one at a cellular level. So on the left here, you see a movie of a life of a bacteria in about 60 minutes. So the bright dots here are the, um, the receptor clusters that are um, in the bacteria to have a tumor paxis function. And uh, so the uh, so the, in this part of the talk, I will talk about how receptor and receptor actually coordinate each other to form this hemotaxis function. And uh, on the right here is the swimming bacteria. So these are E. coli, which are the, the bacteria that are living in our gut. And then uh, non-pathogenic, so they, my biology collaborator said you can actually drink it. I never tried it, but it's, uh, it's very safe to work with them. So the, what's, what's different from the usual bacteria living in your guts are the ones, the, the, these guys are uh, fluorescent. So we put fluorescent plasmid inside so that we can look at it. So you can see that they are very dynamic. They swim around and uh, so when I looked at this picture at the beginning, I thought, well, they got to be chemically or mechanically communicating each other, and it would be a wonderful system to look at how chemical, uh, mechanical interaction influence the macro scale behavior of bacteria. So uh, the first part of talk, um, it, con it consists of both experiment and theoretical work. So the uh, uh, most of all the experiments are done by Eugene Carlini, who's a postdoc in my lab. And uh, um, our theoretical collaborators are Yu Hai Chu, who is at IBM, and uh, his student, Lili Zhang. And so the basic approach that we took to look at this problem is a, a multi-scale approach, as you can see this is a uh, to be universal approach in this conference now, so I don't really need to make an emphasis here. So basically we look at from molecule scale up to cell scale and uh, um, scale up to uh, millimeter, um, which we call macro scale. So why E. coli? So E. coli um, is something I view as a perfect model system for engineers and physicists. So here is a cartoon of E. coli. And uh, so when I look at it, it's, it's almost like a micro, micro robot or micro machine. So it has its own sensory system here, which is the receptor cluster that you saw in the early movie. And uh, so these receptor forms cluster because they interact with each other, which I'll talk uh, um, more later on. So when they bind to the chemicals in the surrounding area, it sends a signal to this, uh, this uh, protein called PA, say, make a conformation of change. So this is the way uh, bacteria uh, responds to the surrounding. So the conformation change of PA will facilitate the phosphorylation of this diffusible a uh, chemical called protein called PY, which then go on turn the flagella left or uh, right. So the flagella turns either clockwise or counterclockwise. So the internal machinery is very simple. It's, it's basically the main, main thing is this PA uh, in active state, which is conformational change. You can think of it like flower opened up. And uh, an inactive state, where is a different conformation state 
where that it, it's basically inhibit the phosphorylation of this Q R. And uh, so what is remarkable about this is not only that it has a sensory system, responding system, it also has an adaptation system. So it's just like our eyes, when we go out in the sunlight, our um, iris turns smaller because it's too bright. So the same thing happens in bacteria. When the, there are too, too much activity going on in PA, it, the same thing that facilitate the QY to be phosphorate, also facilitate phosphorylation of, uh, of the uh, adaptation protein, which, which tune down the sensitivity of the bacteria. So it, it basically has everything an engineer one. It has input, output, control, and adaptation. So um, this organism has been a model system for chemosensing for um, about quite ma many years, uh, about 30 years now. And so two things that is important to remember is the one is the sensitivity. You can sense very little, um, low concentration of chemicals in the environment. And the second thing is it has a wide range of sensing, which means it can sense a wide range of chemical concentration. So here is the um, uh, Photo, a, a, a photograph, a rendition of the solvents from the lab uh, to show how bacteria moves. So, so when the when the flagella counter rotates counterclockwise, it moves the bacteria forward. When the flagella turns clockwise, it jams. And uh, in this case, the flagella flies apart and the, the bacteria tumbles. So when uh, when you put um, uh, bacteria culture on the microscope, this is what you see. And so here you see bacteria moves around, and you also see these rings. So these are the rings that is caused by uh, lens vibration. And usually biologists don't like this because it makes the images don't look as pretty as they should be. However, for physicists and engineers, this, this is another thing that we can actually use to probe more information than what we can get from a normal microscope. So it turns out that this ring size is uh, monotonically dependent on the Z position uh, with respect of the bacteria with respect to the focal length, focal point of the, uh, of the microscope. So we can use the ring size to calculate the Z position of the bacteria. So for an image like this, instead of a 2D image, we can figure out XYZ position of the bacteria and uh, as a return using the uh, usual tracking mechanism we do in fluid mechanics, uh, we could find out the trajectories of the bacteria in 3D using a normal fluorescent microscope. So these uh, uh, software are now posted on the website if anyone is interested in using them, yeah, feel free to download them. Um, so if you look at the uh, um, close up of these tracks, you can clearly see these, uh, the wrong, wrong turn, wrong tumble, wrong tumble mm -hmm. characteristics. And here are two images uh, um, I took from Howard Burke's publication in which they, uh, they uh, made the, for the flagella fluorescent. And uh, so in this case, you can see that when the bacteria is making a run, it, the, the flagella bundles up in one bundle, and it dynamically is going counterclockwise. And uh, when the flagella flies apart, the bacteria tumbles. And so these are the two states that bacteria has. So bacterial chemotaxis is a classical problem many people have worked on it. So this is a um, movie that's taken in, in my lab in a microfluid device. So what, what, what we are seeing is the uh, bacteria is uh, sitting in a chemical gradient with a higher concentration towards the right, a lower concentration towards the left. So uh, at the behavioral level, Howard Berg uh, in Harvard has figured out 30 years ago that uh, um, the, the mechanism that bacteria do chemotaxis, which is that 
they actually lengthen the wrong time when they when they feel that to be chemo attractive concentration is becoming higher and higher. And uh, and they do nothing if it is the chemo attractive is decreasing or um, or is not changing. So uh, so this has been figured out 30 years ago. And uh, uh, during the past 30 years, many work has been carried out to look at the signaling transduction pathway in, uh, that's responsible for this uh, chemotaxis behavior. So this map is also quite clear now that uh, um, what is going on, how does bacteria, at the molecular level, how does, mo uh, how does bacteria sense, what protein does the bacteria use to sense, and then translating into the motor protein. So that's also uh, worked out uh, quite nicely with many kinetic constants measured uh, using front experiment. So basically the key issue here is there are five receptors that are responsible for bacterial chemotaxis. And two of them are the most abundant, which has a copy number close to 20,000. And these are minor receptors, which is close to a few hundred receptor numbers. And so we basically looked at these two receptors, TSR and TAR, which are the most abundant receptor number. And uh, so the, um, here are the, uh, the contribution to these pathway mostly from uh, Howard Berg in this part of sensing and control part and uh, Cliff Cruzel uh, in the motor kinetics part. So, um, so uh, what we have, as I said, that the many people have worked on this field and uh, uh, it's, it's really not a good place for me to do a review here. So um, I'm just going to say that uh, what we come in is really to use the uh, advanced tool, which is our imaging technique and our microfluidic device to make a, a missing link which to connect the molecule scale uh, knowledge into the behavioral scale knowledge. So, the experiment uh, <coughs> setup we have is um, agarose gel based microfluidic chemotaxis device. So, this is a, a device that we have developed specifically for bacterial chemotaxis. And the idea behind it is very simple. Uh, we take an agarose gel membrane about one millimeter thick, and we pack in three channels, parallel channels on it, and we flow chemicals in one channel, buffers in the other. Because of diffusion, there is a linear gradient established in the center channel. And uh, so here is the, um, an image taken by flowing fluorescing in one channel and buffering in the other channel. So you can see that the linear gradient is uh, um, established across all three channels because of the fact that the uh, Avros gel, which is the material we use for this uh, device that has the diffusion coefficient very close to water. And so the center channel is the place where we see the bacteria and uh, the bacterial migration towards the chemo attractant is imaged by the microscope. So another additional advantage of this is we can make many devices on this one chip. So usually we have four chips, uh, four devices on one chip and, and as a result we do four experiments at one time. And which saves a lot of time, which is actually quite important. We discovered that uh, um, the, um, it, there are a lot of issues that if you do experiments today and tomorrow, they are not entirely reproducible. So it's kind of critical to do 12 experiments in one day so that all the data points in one plot actually make sense. So that part we are still tutoring on it. We, um, I, uh, we think we know what the problem is, but it's, uh, it's, um, uh, for cell, bi uh, cell biology experiments, it seems to be very critical to be able to do um, many experiments at the same time. So high throughput uh, using microfluidic device seems to be the way to go. So we are uh, further 
we had a further luck with uh, um, a dynamic equilibrium, equilibrium I call. Uh, so when we look at this um, steady state, so the steady state movie. So this is the uh, the uh, movie that's taken after uh, about eight minutes the chemical attractant has flowed into our channel. So the, by then the chemical gradient is stead, in a steady state. And we find that uh, the, uh, the bacteria chemotactic uh, process is actually a is an equilibrium state in the sense that uh, the chemoattractant wants the bacteria to go to the right side, but the diffusion due to the density gradient wants the cell to go to the other direction. So as a result, we get a dynamic, uh, dynamic steady state, which is quite important for us because the, uh, uh, the data is quite noisy. So in this case, we could take 500 images and average them, and we would be able to get some um, useful information, uh, quantitative information out of these images. And so this is the usual way we uh, um, do our data analysis. We track the uh, bacteria, and from these tracks, we can figure out what is the density profile look like. And so this is the chemical gradient. So here, this is the, uh, the good luck I was talking about, the balance between diffusion due to density gradient and chemotactic migration. And so from this, if you solve this equation, it's, a, it's an exponential decay. So the decay constant will provide us with the chemotactic drift velocity. So this drift velocity is uh, one of the parameters that we use to characterize how sensitive bacteria is. And the other um, parameter we use as the chemosensitivity measure is the uh, um, chemotactic migration coefficient. So uh, it's basically the average Y position of all the cells, so Y is like this in this direction. So if CMC is zero, it means the cells are uniformly distributed in the same channel. And if it's one, they all migrate to the chemoattractant side. And so that's, that's basically a second measure of what chemosensitivity is. So uh, this, this just to prove that we indeed get an um, um, equilibrium state. So this is the CMC as time, and you can see that with time, CMC changes. So CMC is the chemotactic migration coefficient, and it reaches steady state to, uh, at about eight minutes. So the first thing we did is we looked at the uh, um, chemosensitivity curve of for both two receptors that I talked about, the most abundant receptor, TAR and PSR. And we find, so the dots are the uh, experimental data, and the lines are theoretical data. And uh, so mm -hmm. we find that the, uh, the bacteria has a very wide chemosensing range and with, with a higher sensitivity. So in order to uh, explain that, it is uh, not sufficient to just to use the classical kinetic theory, which says that uh, the, uh, um, the receptors don't interact with each other. Each receptor is an individual entity. And uh, so the uh, chemosensitivity is governed by the rate change of the ligand receptor binding. So if that's the case, then the, uh, this is the rate change of uh, ligand receptor binding, then it would be proportional to delta L over L. And uh, this basically tells us that if we plot chemosensitivity versus delta L over L, which is the plot I show you in the last plot, um, then we would have a very narrow concentration region. And this the high sensitivity region is going to be close to KD. So for, for example, for receptor TAR, KD, uh, an unmodified receptor, KD is around 18 uh, micromolar. And uh, uh, so this obviously cannot explain the experimental data we had where our sensitivity uh, extended to, to uh, more than minimum. So the question is, uh, how could bacteria do 
chemo sensing with such wide um, range of sensitivity. So the question started, uh, uh, the answer started to become clear towards the end of, uh, um, towards 1998-1999, where people started to look at the actual um, structure of the receptor. And uh, uh, they find this through the cryo-electron microscope, and they find that these receptors actually they cluster together. And uh, so this is a, a <laughs> one cluster. It's a transmembrane receptor. So here the membrane is here, side the membrane, where they do their uh, work of binding with the ligand. And, and the, here is the controlling site, which uh, adaptation site. Sorry, the, uh, so which is we call methylation site. And the, here is the TA, which is the one that makes conformation of change that uh, facilitates the phosphorylation of T, TY, which turns the motor. So, uh, so the idea is that uh, the fact that uh, these receptors are all connected down here, the TA activity change might influence the receptor cluster in a cooperative way. So that's basically the key point that uh, um, uh, that the the uh, bacteria has uh, such high uh, chemosensitivity. So there are uh, so this is the uh, one of the early papers. There are actually uh, um, quite a, a few theoretical calculations on the point. So this one is the the first one that uh, uh, to propose that. Uh, and maybe the uh, receptor goes active or not, uh, inactive is just like the spin, the magnetic spin goes up and down in a magnetic field. And the ligand binding is just like a magnetic field. So, uh, so uh, this group, Ben Spray's group, basically um, hypothesized that the receptor, and then a, a receptor was in an inactive state. In fact, it influenced its neighboring receptors through this PA conformation, and uh, such that it, uh, it, it influences the neighboring space such that they all align to the same direction, which means they are either both all active or non-active. So here, the dark is, is uh, uh, inactive, and the white is active. So in high, is, uh, is, is our theoretical call Collaborated. So next two slides is all you high work. Um, so uh, basically, you high took the idea from uh, uh, biochemistry. So in biochemistry, there is a uh, what's so called a MWC model, uh, which uh, which says that uh, the conformational state of regulate proteins are determined by the thermal dynamic equilibrium. So this is a uh, this is the uh, uh, well established in biochemistry, but it really hasn't been used in uh, in uh, a, a real in in the uh, uh, in the setting where like the way that physicists use like writing down um, Hamiltonian. So what he hide it is he wrote down Hamiltonian for the uh, for the different states. So the uh, the energy state is uh, illustrated by the cartoon here. Suppose you have two receptor, one is inactive. So A, is, A equals zero is inactive, active is a one. And uh, when the ligand binds to both these receptors, it makes the uh, uh, active receptor uh, increase its free energy. So this is caused by the kinetic, uh, the kinetic associated, the kinetic constant change in inactive and uh, in ligand binding and uh, non-binding state. And same thing happened that uh, when the uh, when the methylation group put a methylation state on the uh, uh, on the uh, inactive uh, receptor, it lowers down the inactive uh, uh, receptor's energy level. So taking into this consideration, you high uh, wrote down the Hamiltonian for this system, which is uh, basically this this is the energy of active. Uh, receptors and this is inactive receptors. So the uh, the coupling that I talked about how the um, how the receptor is influencing the neighboring receptor, the conformational change of this PA is included in this. So this 
this is uh, uh, less than one, so it it uh, tends to align every ordinate ring receptor in one state. So, um, so one could uh, the theorist in the room uh, know much more than I do in this case. So what he had did is he uh, used the mean field theory uh, for this Hamiltonian and. Uh, so there are also a, a little twist here. The methylation is happening at a much slower time scale uh, as the uh, uh, ligand binding and unbinding. So in this case, this is millisecond and this is minutes. So what he did is he separated these two. So the, this Hamiltonian is just for one methylation state. And he calculates for uh, the total five methylation states. And so he used the mean field theory, and uh, uh, so you can get an analytical function of the um, activity, which uh, is this A here. So this activity of P A can directly be translated into the into the clockwise or counterclockwise motion of the um, of the bacteria. So when we took this and uh, um, calculated the uh, density profile that is uh, uh, that is the, the density profile of the bacteria in a linear chemical gradient, and this is what we get in experiment. So in the experiment, we fix the average concentration of the uh, chemical attractant and we increase the gradient. And uh, so you can see that the cells become more chemotactic as the chemo the gradient increases. And in this case, we fix the gradient and change the, uh, the, uh, um, the average concentration. So the reason for this exercise is to, to uh, test one of the hypotheses, which was also proposed in, 30, in uh, 70s, that uh, bacteria actually sense uh, concentration at the logarithmic scale. So if it's a logarithmic scale, then they should go down with the um, average concentration and go up with the gradient. <laughs> so this is, uh, in fact, in, uh, indeed the case. So the, these, uh, these data, um, as I said, because of the microfluidics and all the tracking, they is, in fact, precise enough to be able to reveal the fact that uh, the decay constant, which is proportional to the the drift law, average drift velocity is actually uh, linearly proportional to the gradient of the um, concentration, L is the chemical concentration. So this is, uh, um, again, it's nature's way of, uh, of uh, managing a, a wide range of signaling. So from this experiment, we uh, we learned quite a lot. We thought that it looks like from this picture, it looks like uh, um, it doesn't really matter with, whether it's TSR or TAR. Receptor doesn't seem to matter too much. So we thought that uh, uh, maybe receptor number is the only controlling parameter for the, for the chemo sensing. So we did a, a second experiment where we put a different chemo attractant into, uh, into the two-sided channel. And one is the ligand for TAR, which is one receptor, and then the other is a ligand for the other receptor. And uh, um, interestingly, we find that the, uh, um, the thing, so this is the uh, CMC. I, uh, so this is for historical reason, I call it chemo index, chemotaxis index. And so what, the message in this plot is that the, what matters is actually only the receptor number ratio. If the bacteria, so in this case, we control the receptor number. We put the receptor plasmid in the, in the system. So what happened is when the bacteria basically sits there, um, the numbers of receptors on its memory. If we decide that I have more TAR, it would just go towards the uh, where uh, TAR is uh, TAR ligand is higher, and then when the uh, um, receptor TSR is is larger, yeah. and it does the same thing. So it really doesn't matter which receptor it is. So this is quite gratifying for physicists. And, and there are some level of universality underneath the, uh, these biological problems. <coughs> 
So I'm going to switch gear to go from chem uh, chemical to uh, mechanical. And uh, so, uh, in fact, the, the, the collective dynamics uh, in, uh, in bacteria suspension, uh, when, when I started to look at this problem, I always thought it's, it's chemical. So we actually did, this is actually part of the reason we, um, we, we did this chemosensing experiment. Yes. Um, okay. So, uh, but we, uh, so it turns out uh, that in this specific bacteria that we use, that they move so fast that uh, the, the diffusion of the chemicals is too slow for us actually to see any effect. So the uh, um, so the the uh, the result is at this moment I think there are still interesting problems there how chemical sensing among bacteria influences its uh, uh, migration. Uh, however, for this specific uh, E. coli, uh, we find that the only interaction we have observed is uh, hydrodynamic hydrodynamic uh, hydrodynamic interaction. So this work uh, mostly is done by Kim Liao, a postdoc in my group, and uh, a few undergraduate students. And Cassiope is a graduate student here um, with uh, Don Koch, who's a theorist. And uh, so Cassiope is going to give a poster on more details of, uh, of, uh, of this problem. I only have four minutes to do um, So basically, the uh, um, E. coli motion uh, this morning there are a few, um, I shall talk about the asymmetry lead to motion. So this is another example of asymmetry uh, lead to bacterial motion. So basically bacteria in part is forced to the fluid in an asymmetric way. The reason is because the, the force around the, around the head is uh, imparted in a volume of uh, uh, a size of about one micron, while the, uh, the backward force is distributed along the tail, which is about six, seven micron. So this asymmetry basically lead to the um, first order um, fluid flow to be um, um, first order of force that's imparted to the fluid to be a, a dipole. And uh, so Dom had a uh, Look at that, uh, you uh, write down the uh, uh, modified Stokes equation. So everything is the same because it's low Reynolds numbers. So the only contribution here is uh, uh, the, uh, the force exerted by bacteria to the to, uh, to the fluid. So luckily, the uh, the this stress term is quite similar to the polymer, except in the bacteria case, it pushes fluid. Uh, for outward in, in, the, in the case of uh, polymer, it uh, contracts. So you just need to flip a sign, and uh, a lot of things that have been uh, in polymer can be used uh, here. So the first uh, experiment we did is we did uh, the velocity, pair velocity correlation. And uh, so Dom used uh, the theory that I um, uh, proposed in the previous slide, and so it fits reasonably well. So this is our longitudinal pair velocity and the normal pair velocity. And uh, in Dunn's uh, uh, case, it is, the theory is still six times um, uh, below our experimental data, and uh, um, the, now uh, Dunn's, uh, uh, they think that, that they have a way to fix this. So, um, so one of the interesting things that we find in the correlation is that uh, the uh, correlation uh, starts to um, become significant around length scale about 10 micron. So these are no, a longitudinal and a normal velocity correlation. So we thought that uh, uh, if the um, if this uh, 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 bacteria is uh, communicate with each other around 10 micron, then we could vary the uh, bacterial um, density and to see what is the transport properties of the bacterial suspension. So we measure the diffusion coefficient as a function of cell density and uh, find that indeed around, so this uh, uh, volume of uh, um, 
10 to 9 cells per, per meal is corresponding to about cell cell distance 10 micron. So indeed, this shows up. So we think this is because of the bacteria as a gem. So this, this dip doesn't show up in theoretical calculation. So I'm going to skip this problem here. So I'm going to leave you with uh, um, uh, one of the most recent developments uh, in my lab. So uh, it turns out that uh, a lot of things we learned in bacteria can be translated into a mammalian cell chemotaxis. And the mammalian cell chemotaxis play important roles in many physiological problems. And I listed the field here, development in immune cell tissue formation, cancer metastasis. And uh, um, so the question is, uh, how can we use the, the, the tools that we have developed and the ideas we have developed in bacterial chemotaxis and uh, to look at some more sophisticated uh, system. So here I'm going to uh, end with this movie, which is the dendritic cells moving in a gradient of uh, uh, chemokine, it's a lymphoid uh, chemokine. So you can see that these cells um, are very dynamic, just like a bacteria, and they form a cluster, and, uh, uh, and they migrate uh, readily towards where the uh, chemo concentration uh, is higher. So the question is, uh, um, does the receptor in these more sophisticated cell lines, in this case, is the cell, do they talk to each other? And do they have an adaptation system? So these are the um, range of things that we are working on. Thank you. I'm not sure we can open this talk, so let's try that. Uh, maybe I missed the point in the second part. Uh -huh. Can you show that the book in the second part of the velocity velocity correlation? Right. Can you show that the actually this hydrogen? Yeah, we want to put it down a bit because title is not coming on. Let me just take it down and down. Okay. Maybe this slide needs to be there. Yeah, it's there. Yeah, it's there. Right, so what happened okay. is it, um, um, so because the, so the fluid here is uh, um, moving outwards, so when a bacteria moves uh, connects to it, it feels the fluid flow. Right, so what is the graph on the right? Do you actually measure the point? Yeah, so, so the dotted points are the measured points. And then using the uh, modified Stokes theory, you can calculate the correlation function. So, uh, so we plot these two together. It works. Yeah, not quite. So the theory is six times uh, lower than our experiment. So we, um, so, so my collaborator Don and uh, his students think they know what the problem is. But it's still um, problems. Yeah. This file form is yeah. 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 But why isn't it done with them? Why am I not in the file? Hey, on so the next slide, you, you show the diffusion of bacteria as a function of density. Yes. 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 So it's already yes. undue. So, no. so you said that what when you increase it? the density, at some so point, it where the density size of the average distance between bacteria is so the microns, the diffusion is the largest. Yes. Right. So I don't know right. how to do that. Yeah. Let's try it here. Do, do you have some intuitive explanation? Of yes, why yes. Why? So this is the like in oh, contradiction to Asha's result in the morning. Mm -hmm. right. when the he control. has more of these chains, the, uh, the diffusion coefficient is decreasing. In our case, it's increasing. So this is entirely because when the, uh, uh, suppose you have a very dilute system, the fluid, the interaction doesn't show up because they are too far apart. Because the the uh, fluid flow, uh, the uh, the uh, the fluid flow that's uh, um, induced by the swimming bacteria is in the vicinity of uh, its short range. So the only when they are 
close enough that they can what, it has uh, feel the floor minute that is but clear that's and that's the the morning. Morning. then they can. Close the they, uh, so yes. according to this, uh, uh, they like to trail each other. And so this is the entire, we have to seen it in the real experiment yet, but it's entirely from okay. this correlation. So, I, I have a question. Uh, did you try to vary the gradient uh, this time? And it looked like your setup can easily do that. And what, what do you think will happen there? You will get additional information from time varying gradients. Time varying gradients. So, there are a lot of work on time varying gradients. Brain to buy uh, uh, so for all you need to keep the so camera the, open. They actually, okay, yeah, so they can have it. Okay, so forget about it. Uh, but we have to change tape also. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Very nice work. Uh, I also was wondering how statistically significant uh, this thing is. Uh, if it was due to hydrodynamics, I might have expected diffusion coefficient to maybe increase linearly or quadratically with the cell density. But you sort of seem to have a spike and otherwise more or less constant. Is that because the statistics is not much? Well, um, yeah, so there, there are things that we, we have not taken into account like uh, um, rotational diffusion and uh, running motion of the beads. So, uh, that is uh, that is that could be one of the factors. So yeah. I think let's take a speaker again. And so our our second talk is actually from it's for the first talk from a real biologist in here. So Baron so Roy Welsh, his PhD is from a University of Wisconsin Madison. Uh, and then he moved to Stanford to his postdoc with Dale Kaiser, and he has been in Syracuse up to then after that. And he was going to be talking about genomics of emergent. Okay, um, first of all, this is actually the first time that I've ever given a, a talk at a, at a conference where the university was sort of my home, uh, home site, so I'm used to sort of being jet lagged and sitting in the back and feeling exhausted, but now I get to watch all of you feel that way, and actually I didn't have to get up until 8 o'clock this morning. But um, I would like to thank, first of all, uh, Christina Marchetti for, for asking me to, to maybe even be a small part of organizing this. Um, I, uh, I was surprisingly nervous preparing this talk. Uh, I'm used to giving talks in front of microbiologists and sort of doing the same microbiology dog and pony show, and uh, and